Good afternoon. My name's Kevin Graham, and this is the Thursday Bulletin. Um, and as usual, on a Thursday, I'm joined by J.P. Mason. J.P., what's happening? Uh, I good to be back. It's been a couple of weeks off. But, uh, yeah, it's nice to be back to talk Celtic again. Uh, I see you're sporting a Jesus and Mary chain t-shirt. The, yes. I don't care what... Don't care what anybody says about talking music. I want to ask about the primal screen gig because I've not spoken to anybody about it. It was utterly amazing. I went on the Friday night and it was like just a big massive event. And I, I mean, I first saw the primal scream in 1986 at Glasgow Green. Uh, they had a big, they had a big tent in Glasgow Green. So yeah. that's almost 30 years that I've been watching a band and. I didn't think they could surprise me anymore, but that is up there with one of the best gigs I've ever been to. It was wow. an utter celebration. Uh, the fact that they brought Manny on for the for the encore as well just sort of I got probably too ex I, I got probably too excited at Manny coming on that my wife had to tell me to calm down. And it was only <laughs> a guy coming on to play bass, eh? but uh, I it was fantastic, JP and uh, everybody that. Um, I've spoke to it. It's been there. Actually, I agreed with me. This is it was utterly what a celebration of an album. What a celebration of Andrew Weatherall. What a celebration to Robert Young as well. Um, aye, it was just really, really good. I always, I always say this, right? It doesn't matter how many times I go to see the Primal Scream. I always walk out and go, they'll never top that. I'm never going to go back. That's it. That's my final time seeing them. But I know for a fact that it'll go by. Uh, JP, I know for a fact that it'll go back. I think the fact that it was in a tent probably added a lot to it because I, I saw James in a tent a couple of weeks ago and it was absolutely euphoric, you know, just seeing seeing a band in a tent. You know, it's the memories like tea in the park and stuff like that. So um, can you hear me? I, I can hear you. I, I. Just, just your, your facial expression there was as if. No, no. It. I'm trying. I'm trying to sort my microphone. <laughs> That's oh, yeah. what I'm trying to sort. Uh, I know. I'm glad you. I'm glad you were there. Of, of all the people, <laughs> of all the people that I know, I, I, I mean, I don't think it would have been fair in the world if you hadn't been at that gig or one of those gigs. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm I, I was. I was I, in Belgium. I went to see Metallica and Pearl Jam in Belgium. So nice. Um, so that was where I was on the on the Friday, and then delayed four hours coming back for Brussels Charleroi on uh, the Saturday, which was really enjoyable. Uh, <laughs> four four hours in a basically the Belgian Prestwick, which is what Charleroi is. So it's uh, the in, terms amenities, in terms of amenities, there's not much going on there. So uh, yeah, it was a bit it was a bit boring. But uh, well, anyway, that's three minutes talking three about. Minutes <laughs> Three minutes of music chat, but we'll bring in some other music chat. Ridiculous are uh, playing the Hoops Bar Los Cristianos, Tenerife today, 6 pm. Come along if you're in the area for some Beatles and classic tracks through the oh, years. So, then, so, so there we go. We'll have, we'll have a wee advert for anybody that's watching us on holiday in Tenerife. I know Stevie uh, owns the Hoops Bar in Los Cristianos in Tenerife. His wife, Julian, used to babysit me. Amazing. So they're is it on that strip? You know that big long strip in Los Cristianos? Is that where it's on? Because I used to, I went and hold it when I was 13 or something and there was a there was a pub called The Old Bill right at the end. So it was like this huge long strip of bars in Los Cristianos and there wasn't a Celtic pub there when I was there. I mean, it was a lot they've recent, the, uh, They've recently moved. I know yeah. that they, they, they have, uh, there used to be across the road for a hotel. I can't remember the name of the hotel, but uh, they recently moved because I saw it on social media that there were uh, that there were uh, new premises and that. So if you're in Tenerife, get yourself along to Stevie uh, Celt and the Hoops Celt Bar. Celtic uh, pubs, Celtic pubs uh, on holiday are uh, dynamite. I was at the Paradise Bar in uh, Marmaris. What a place that is. Um, they've they've trained all their staff to sing Celtic songs, which is potentially <laughs> potentially a bit cruel. But um, they just come round singing like Fields of Athens, Rye and all that. It's it's quite bizarre. Uh, there's these young <laughs> Turkish guys just singing Fields of Athens, Rye, <laughs> and a kind oh. of and an attempted Scottish accent as well, which is which is even better. Um, but oh. I saw that. I watched the remember when we got beat off Arsenal in the Champions League qualifier. Remember yes, the Gary Caldwell own goal one. 2009, I watched that game in, in the Paradise Paradise Bar in Marmaris. So. 
we'd, we'd like to be in sunnier climes right now, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be here in the sort of slightly grey skies of Glasgow talking about Celtic. Aye, well, it has been nice for a couple of days, and now yeah. the Celtic team, we better get on to the Celtic chat, JP, because <laughs> folk, folk will be having a go at us, eh? Well, um, aye. Uh, aye, so the Celtic team are back in Glasgow today. They'll probably be having a rest day today after their 10-day or 14-day training camp in Austria and the Czech Republic. Um now we've had three games in the chat. Right? We've had three games on this. I don't know how much that you've got to see them the, in the pre-season, but I think Ange Postecoglou last night after our one against Banico Strava actually said it's been a good pre-season trip. We got some good training into the guys, and we've played some good minutes of football. We've also got no significant injuries, which is important. It's been a really good, good camp. The players have come back and and had a good attitude. I think, like, when you have a look at the three games, the three games are, are, are three completely separate games, but they were used for different things when you actually look back on it now. The first game against the Victoria Wiener or Wiener Victoria, I, I can't remember what, why that goes now. It just doesn't matter. Um, and that game, for me, that, 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 was, that was like um, fringe guys and the young guys. That actually mm. shown in that game. They, they, they got they, the guys that were a week earlier back in training got that game, and that was the game where Boss and Wall, uh, John Joe, uh, John Joe Kenny, and Rocco Vata sort of Johnny sort of, Kenny, John Johnny Joe Kenny, <laughs> sort of, Johnny <laughs> Kenny, uh, Johnny Kenny, um, Sean in that game. Then you got the game against the despicable Rapid Vienna, and I'm still going to call them despicable, and they will always be despicable. Uh, two guys my age. And this is when the that was when the first teamers sort of returned, and you saw them just getting up to Mark sharpness against a team that was actually about three or four weeks further ahead of us in preparation. Their league, the Rapid Vienna's league season starts this weekend, and I really hope that they get relegated and they get beat every single game that they actually play. And last night you had a great game in, in uh, Ostrava. Um, it's one of the most enjoy. It's one of the most enjoyable uh, preseason games I've actually seen for quite a number of years, and you saw the first teamers increase the tempo. I think you saw a more settled sign. None of the young lads actually got on when they made all the changes at the end. So this was Celtic ramping up their preseason uh, preparations last night. It was a great atmosphere, great tempo last night. What's been your view of preseason uh, so far? Uh, I didn't see much of the kickabout and what looked like, uh, I don't know, it looked like Bathgate, Bathgate Thistles uh, Park against Wiener Victoria. Um, there wasn't much to write home about that game other than the fact that it got some people some game time. The game well, the Want to know something, JP? I watched that game for 30 minutes, then I mm -hmm. gave up when I noticed there was a woman walking her dog watching the game. <laughs> I just went, I'm getting, I'm getting. We were four and a half up at the time, and I was, I'm getting this up. I said, right. there's, a, there's, a, there's a woman out walking her dog before she goes home for her tea. <laughs> did, did Julian steal a goal off somebody for his hat trick, though? Is that, did that happen? I'm sure I read that or saw it. Yes, he did. He, he, he stole the goal of Johnny Kenny, and I'm already going to call him Johnny now. Aye. Yeah. Johnny Kenny was going for his hat trick, and Big Julian had stormed up the park and decided that he was getting, he was going to push him out the road, and he threw him up the road and nodded it into the back Aye. of the net. That is, an, that is an overreaction, but he did, that's what it looked like. No mercy, no mercy. Aye. Aye. Well, I saw that, and then I was at a Transmit Festival. So, sorry for mentioning music again, but I was at Transmit Festival, and... Uh, on Saturday, probably watching Fontaine's DC actually at that exact time the game was on, which and they were brilliant, and uh, what a reaction they got as well. It was it was it was some uh, some it's atmosphere for their set um, on the main stage. But uh, so I, I haven't really seen much of the the three each draw. I saw a tweet as well saying that there was going to be replayed. There was going to be a a second leg or a replay at Old Trafford that with no fans, which was pretty good part of, if you know your. Uh, I know. Rapid. Rapid Vienna history, um, and then but last night I saw the whole game and um, it was good to see. I, I didn't realise how much I'd kind of missed watching Celtic. You know, you 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 think to yourself, oh, it's good to have a bit of a break for the football and everything else. But as soon as you see 
the team going out, I was just looking at that last night going, oh, I wish I was there, because the atmosphere did look really good. You know, it was like, it was their centenary uh, anniversary, wasn't it? Their, their, their celebrations, that's why. It was, had, yes. Yeah, so they were they were going for it, and they were going for it on the pitch as well. There was not a lot of uh, quarter given in some of the challenges, and they certainly didn't look like they wanted to get beat in front of, a, well, what seemed like a full house of their fans as well. So, you know, it was good to see every most people back in, in the first team. Um, a bit dodgy from Juranovic at the first goal, but, I mean, it's a, it's a pre-season friendly, you know. I mean, be a bit of a, di a difference if he does that in a Champions League game. <laughs> um, but, you know, get get mistakes out of the way. As just I say last night, as I says last night, JP, any watching scout the first 10 minutes has a Josip Juranovic. That's how <laughs> he plays every week. <laughs> just, right. just watch that first 10 minutes and just leave him alone, just leave him at Celtic. It was his first 45 minutes. And like quite conversely, Tony Ralston comes on for his 45 minutes and looks completely up to speed right away. Yeah, yeah. Sets up that goal for Giacomacchus with some finish as well. I love a kind of any, anything of uh, overhead variety I, I've always been fond of, um, just because it always looks spectacular. And, you know, they just, I don't know, there, there looks like a really a really good togetherness. You saw the wee look from Giacomacchus to Ralston after he set up the goal. And, you know, there's 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 definitely a good bond there within the, within the camp. And the people have been shipped out that were surplus to requirements. You know, Ange Postacoglu, is a, seems to be a good judge of character and a good judge of a football player and he's made the judgments to to ship out the guys that, that we're never going to get a game at Celtic anymore, you know, like the likes of Ball and Golly and Sorrow and unfortunately Barkas as well. Um, they, they're still they're, losing they're, goals. Yeah, you, yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> he got a hard time for that Queen's Park friendly, but I think he was subbed off at half-time uh, in that game and he only lost one goal and it was a tap-in. So I'm uh, not that I'm some sort of uh, defender of. No, we, we like, need to talk him up because we want him off the wage bill for a for a serious fee. So we want him to do well, and I think I, I, I think they actually got gubbed for one the other night with him in goals as well. Oh, did they? Oh, another Aye. game. Oh God! Right, all right. Well, uh -huh. let's uh, let's hope so... we improve. But yeah, no, it was good to see the game last night, and uh, yeah, again, like I was kind of. Me and my pal started looking at flights to Warsaw for the Boric game, but um, it's a bit uh, it's a bit planes, trains, and, and automobiles to get there, um, and it's like a six a.m. flight to get home the next morning. It's just like you want to go somewhere and enjoy yourself. You don't want to go somewhere and be worrying about getting to the airport the next morning. So I think I'll uh, I'll pass on that one. And... Sorry, go on. It's quite a weird pre-season, eh? We've got Rapid, who we didn't like, and we've mm. got Legia of Warsaw, who they didn't like us. Uh, I don't think they've got any beef with the Celtic fans, but they've got a lot of beef with UEFA. I mean, we've got beef with UEFA. I've got, I reckon my beef with UEFA started at the Rapid Vienna game. <laughs> I think that's <laughs> when I first realised that UEFA, that UEFA were a corrupt organisation. Uh, well, but obviously Legia, I've got a bit of... They're apparently boycotting they're apparently boycotting the game because of the ticket price. They're not. It's not because it's against Celtic. It's they're, they're It's thirty euros for a ticket for the like a Warsaw game for the Boric game, and they I think their standard price for a ticket is about twelve euros. Right. Okay. So they're 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 they're, they're having to like be convinced to, to buy tickets and see. I've been to a like a Warsaw game just like a random home game. Uh, and their ultras are it's basically like a full stand so like imagine like the Lisbon Lions stand, it's that stand and it, that full stand Aye. is their ultras and they all wear white and they basically spend the entire game slagging off the North stand the Jockstein stand and the main stand like they do like all this sort of finger pointing chants at them slagging them off for not being like dedicated enough fans and uh, it's, it's quite mental it's uh, <laughs> I don't think that would go down too that, well. That, it's you what? That, that seems to be quite common in Europe. That there seems to be ultra groups and stands against each other. Mm. Um, what one one of uh, Eddie McGough, uh, the Key Town and District, was in Barnick or Strava last night. Was in Barnick last night, or was it mm. Ostrava? I don't know. I didn't care. Geography's <laughs> never been my strong point. Yeah. 
either's like pronunciations of names either. <laughs> um, and he says that uh, his banner, his club's banner, got stolen uh, by right. Bannock Ultras, and yeah. the the Bannock Ultras also attacked the pub that the Celtic fans were in. And oh, really? he says it wasn't a very good trip. He says, right. it, he says it, it, it wasn't very nice. But the Bannock fans that they spoke to, them, which were nice to them, uh, actually did say that they reckon that a game against them could be a yearly thing. Uh, All right. So, I mean, it looked like um, a good. So, like but a good I, he didn't have. What I did notice, what I did notice during the game, uh, JP was that there was two Celtic banners in the Bannock, Bannock end upside down. Mm -hmm. So obviously that's the ultra spoils of war. That's what they do. They steal a banner and they hang it upside down and and, and the home end. All right, eh? and I, and I, and I, 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 that's what they do. That's uh, that's an ultra thing that they'll storm a pub that the the opposition fans are in. They'll steal a banner and they'll hang it up upside down, right? Uh, and and their ultras, but then usually set fire to it. And that's that's <laughs> what. <laughs> so so you see, when you actually say that out loud, it sounds so mental to say, "Oh, I they, they steal a banner and then set fire to it." It's just like these are adult adults that are doing this. I mean, it's not kids, is it? It's probably guys in their 20s or 30s you'd imagine mm -hmm. each to their own i guess <laughs> uh i definitely so i uh, we had we added that they have I mean his banners always in the top tier at the celtic end the the Cree town and district banner it's always there and I, I actually did notice it in the stadium last night but it was stolen after the game uh, so he's and also his passport and wallet was stolen for the same bag but he managed to get that back luckily enough so mm -hmm. The feedback coming back, it hasn't been a great trip for some of the fans that have been out there. I think it's been good for the players. I think the players looked really, really up for it last night. Um, yeah. And Riley. How good was O'Reilly? Oh, he, he's he's just been up a level, man, ain't he? Aye. I think, I think he'll maybe take a bit more responsibility now with Tom Rogic gone. Because he must have felt a bit in Tom Rogic's shadow. You know, given what Tom Rogic has done for Celtic in the past, however, what, nine years or whatever it is, you know, big name player, big occasion player, and now O'Reilly's, you know, closer to a starting spot week in, week out, and the, the responsibilities with him now, and I mean, what that, that was a Rogic-esque goal last night, wasn't it? I mean, the, Oh, the, that was brilliant. That was a great goal. Great team yeah. goal. Aye, aye. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 well. I thought Forrest played well. Um, you know, first half, and I don't know, it just, it augurs well for European games. I'm not saying that we should use last night as a benchmark for, you know, how we're going to play in the Champions League, but it was a pretty intimidating atmosphere to go and play a game in at this stage, and, you know, they showed a bit of character to, you know, they went a goal down, that that crowd could have got on top of them, and, they, they you know, if they'd have scored a second, things could have looked a bit grim, but they got a goal back and then took the lead and we're winning two and a half times. So. I says to Colin, uh, we did the pre-match the, the pre last night and I says to Colin when I, when, I, when I got my feed and I started watching it, I'm going, we could get a bit of a chase in here because the Bannock players must be up like, mm. like the adrenaline must be pumping. They've got a full stadium there. It's the 100th celebration. It's a game that they, do, that they didn't want to lose. Us, it's a pre-season game for us. We, we're just actually trying to get up to speed. So to actually react as well as what we did um, after going a goal down was really, really pleasing. And the fact is, I think we lost the whole game, JP. I think we didn't look in any danger whatsoever. Even when we made the change, even when we made the changes in the setting half, we, we lost a dodgy goal. We just seemed to lose dodgy goals. We didn't seem to lose good goals. We just seemed to lose goals that we should actually stop. But then we, two minutes later, we went up the park and, and we we gave us a two-goal advantage again. I think the attitude of the team was really, really good last night and also the intensity of the team was really, really good mm. last night. Yeah, aye. And, well, just going back to saying how much Banik Estrava wanted it, you see the way the, their striker celebrated his goal? That that, <laughs> that was that was not cel that was <laughs> celebrating a goal in a pre-season friendly. That was celebrating a goal in a... In a knockout tie or something like that, he was like proper knee slide and 
and the place was going bananas. So yeah, it was going we bananas. Up. Dominic Toy says, "What was it with the ball roll last night?" Similarly, the fans were protesting that they weren't invited to the Sydney Super Cup or something like that. What? No, I'm only waiting. <laughs> I was I was just having a wee dig at our neighbours there who, aye, who, who aye, tried aye. to do something like that. The Celtic, did you see the tweet? Still aye, that i bigger, bigger and better super. <laughs> that is absolute wide patter from Celtic. I, I was into that. <laughs> aye, I'm into that sort of wide patter. Eh? I mean, I, I mean, it, it just it's on it's on that cusp of banter, and I right get it right up you. Yeah, but um, but it was, it was really it was really well aimed. Um, and I, I mean, I think it's just been a week. We played Rapid Vienna, and all of a sudden we're going to play Everton, who played Rapid Vienna in that 1985 final that Celtic probably should have been at. Oh, yeah. Wow. So uh, the, 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 this was a conversation that I had. I remember I was going to games round about that time in 85 JP, and this was when the half and half hearts appeared. Mm -hmm. And there used to be lots of Celtic Everton half and half hearts. As much as there's a bond between Celtic and Liverpool, uh, from you know, I listened to the Homeboys podcast, and uh, John Higgins' his brother's a massive Everton fan, like, and he told a story on their podcast, um, recently, like a week or two ago. He was in, was it the Neville Southall testimonial? Celtic played Everton. Yes, yes. Uh -huh. and, and he was wearing an, an Everton strip in the Celtic end and he got called an orange bee and like the, a guy set about him and they ended up scrapping in the, in the Everton end. Oh, sorry, in the Celtic end rather. And he got he got kicked out of the ground and he was with his like, two wee brothers at the time. And um, But that aside, I think there is a bit of a, 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 a kinship between Celtic and Everton, despite the obvious contrast in colours. Um, somebody more educated in the history will be able to tell us what the reason is why there is a relationship between if it's to do with the the Irish uh, collective in Liverpool Everton, Scotty Road boys good boys. Vibe, there you go, must be our supporters I think. well I think Everton were founded by St Domingo eh? it was a, a, a Catholic parish eh? so there's, there's, right? prob there's, pro there's probably a link there eh? All right, okay. So well, that's, that, that's, that's the source, the, isn't it? Aye, aye, that, that, right. that, that is probably the source uh, because I do have a t shirt where it's got uh, Celtic and Everton. It was actually sent to me when I spoke about these half and half hearts before, eh? and mm -hmm. it's got Celtic and Everton, uh, same heritage, if you know the history. So I think it's got something to do with the Catholic background. Uh, Brown Warrior. Uh, they're char Legia are charging the same for this game as the Europa League game, so that's why the Legia Warsaw fans are, are, boycott. are, are, are boycotting it. I thought we were better in Banneker Strava last night. I really did. Um, I, I thought we put them. I, I thought we put them a uh, like. I thought we actually dominated the game, but I've, lo I've, lo I've lost the comment I was going to bring up. Something in the comments says they were an SPFL standard, which is probably true. They finished eight in, in, in the, the Czech League. But what I would say is we've struggled against teams of that quality in Europe over the last couple of seasons. Yeah. Well, I, I, I think we are, have, eh? And the fact, I go back to the fact that we that we disposed of Ferris Varos eh, home and away. Yeah. Only nine, ten months after Ferris Varos put us at the Champions League. I think Aye. that shows that we are actually improving. And we're organised. <laughs> and, people, and people know what what to do, etc. And I, I know their roles. And okay, we're a completely different outfit and beast to what we were under, under Neil Lennon at that time. Everything was fractured. There was so much fractured within the club, within the, the dressing room. You know, when you've got a, a smattering of players that want to leave, how can that possibly... I mean, I would love to know right now if cards on the table, anybody that was playing last night wants to leave Celtic. You know, whether it's public or not, I'd love to know if there is anybody there that's like, I want to move. You know, I'm not enjoying this. I want to be at another club. I want to be in the English, English Premier League. Because I... Maybe I'm being naive and got my Celtic specs on, but I, I can't. I can't think that there would be anybody there right now that wants to leave Celtic. 
No, I think you're right. I think anybody that we would get serious money for wants to hang about. And you just mm -hmm. have to have a look at Josip Juranovic, who who is an utter steal with the, the money that we've actually sp spent on him, who mm -hmm. would probably get a move, who plays for one of the top 10 uh, international sides in, in, mm -hmm. in, in the world, uh, one of the top five in Europe. Mm -hmm. And even he'll hang about for the Champions League. Cameron Carter-Vickers has already says the champ Champions League's a big carrot for him to stay. To stay. Mm -hmm. uh, Kyogo, as well, his journey's just started. O'Reilly, he's already moved up for England, had his eyes completely opened and realised oh, yeah. England, England's still going to be there for him when, once he actually has the best days of his career up here. Because I'll mm -hmm. say that to any player, Celtic mm -hmm. will be the biggest club that you ever play for. Yeah, uh, They will be, unless you actually go to elite level, which maybe some of your players might. But I would say to Matt O'Reilly, really, really enjoy playing for Celtic because this, we will be the biggest club that you ever play for. And there's 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 a list of players out there like your Joe Ledley's and all of that will absolutely agree with me. Oh, I I mean that, that, there's the, the people say that all the time, you know, like oh, wish, I wish I hadn't moved when I did. Should have stayed for another, you know, couple of years or something like that. Or it wasn't my decision to leave Celtic. Some some people say that, you know, where the club takes out of their hands and it's the club that make the decision to sell the player and. The players like, well, I would have stayed. You know, I would have happily stayed and given more, more of my career to Celtic. But I, I just get that feeling from, from the atmosphere in the in the in the camp, and certainly how everybody speaks about the manager. You know, well, why would you want to go and play anywhere else right now when everything that's in front of us right now looks really exciting? Defending the tight well, Julian. Okay. But the thing, the thing is with Julian, he's probably had a conversation with the manager, and the manager said to him, "Look, you're not going to be a starting player for me." And he, at his stage in his career, after the time he's had out, will surely want to just play football week in week out, and he's probably not going to get that at Celtic. So that's why he was on a plane to Germany. And that part about him putting the Instagram story up, I mean, <clears throat> I, I just and then deleting it, you know, at least. Have the courage of your convictions, you know. Like keep the story up. If you're gonna, if you're gonna be a wee bit, well, not a wee bit. If you're gonna be sneaky and be like, "Oh, here's me on a plane with like a couple of a set of eyes," you know, at least leave it up. You know, I mean, don't. Well, why delete it? You know, everybody see that. Everybody knows what you were alluding to. You were on the plane going to move somewhere else. So it's, you know, it's up there. It's up there with Ball and Golly taking a picture of himself on an aeroplane during lockdown. Well, he. I saw that picture again recently. It was the 20 minute Tim's said, Oh, if Celtic aren't going to do a farewell post to volleyball and goal, we will. And they put up the this sort of uh, the, the the daily record um, patented uh, photo of Bolly at the, the the exit of the of the plane just as he was leaving or whatever, covered in covered in Gucci and Prada and stuff like that. And I mean I was I was completely off the bus with that guy after that trip. So I shed absolutely no tears at him leaving um, to go to Mechelen, you know. Just glad but to go. Do, but we do know that the Daily Record had that picture for a week. Aye, that's the mental thing, eh? They did. They did that. That's true, isn't it? And they had it for a week. And then they sat in it and they let him play in a game. Let him play, aye. <laughs> they, Despicable. Aye, well, Despicable aye, really snide, is. Snidery. But um, no, just back to the, the Celtic team. I, I, I get that Julian... It does seem to, I mean, if, if put it this way, if Ange Postacoglu was willing to let Julian go to Schalke, then he's clearly not part of the plans, is he? Like, that, that's, that's, his, that's, that's pretty much set in stone, you would have thought. No, aye, it looks that way. He's on a big wage and it looks like Ange Postacoglu wants to bring in another centre-half. Mm -hmm. um, we'll, we'll get one of the transfers later on the what Ange mm -hmm. Postacoglu says last night, eh? but mm -hmm. I don't think any of the centre-halves that are there or I've been on this pre-season tour, uh, have Stephen Welsh was okay last night. He didn't really do anything wrong. He looked like he's... I always think we look like, the way that we play, we are going to always look like we're desperate defending, especially mm -hmm. if we lose the ball because the way we sit that high up the park, it, always, it is always going to look like we're going to need to cover. And it's mm -hmm. going to be some des desperation challenges. We could be three on two at, at, at times in that as well. Eh? But that's mm -hmm. the way that we're going to play. 
and but and we need two centre halves that are comfortable with that. Stephen Wells didn't really look too comfortable with that. Sometimes Cameron Carter Vickers has proved that he's comfortable with that type of defending, but I still think we need a left hand sided defender, JP. And yeah. that Mark, that view hasn't actually changed over the three games. I says that at the end of last season, and I'm still saying it just now. And nah, surely yeah. somebody with more intelligence than me, as an Ange Postacoglu and the, the coaching staff knows that as well. Well, he's got he's got everything in terms of the transfers we've brought in so far this season. He's got everything kind of in the way that everybody was crying out. We need we need a, a better, not a better left back, but we need another left back to compete with Greg Taylor. He's got that. We need um, another goalkeeper because we've, you know, we wouldn't just want to rely on Scott Bain. So we've got Seagrist, who's proven in this league. Um, who else is we, who else has we signed? Well, we've obviously retained uh, Jota and Carter Vickers, who are proven in in the league. Bernabe, so, the wee left back. You sorry, Bernabe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Back. This, the, everything that that, that um, supporters. We were, we were all saying, oh, well, we probably need this and we probably need that. It's funny that Ange Postacoglu has, has gone out and done, done that exact had done that exact work in the transfer market to get the players in, in the positions that we kind of wanted, which is why the Jordan Larson thing was kind of, he didn't really see that working. You know, it didn't, it just seemed a bit, as much as it was like the idea of it was great, I just didn't ever see that being a, a possibility, Jordan Larson coming to Celtic. It, it, was, it was a bit too nostalgic and I love nostalgia but I just it, it, it just seemed like it was a kind of reactionary and it, I think maybe under maybe Neil Lennon or something like that or, or, or under the way that we used to do transfers Jordan Larson probably would have come in to Celtic because it would have been a one of those reactionary signings that's just not really doesn't it doesn't have this like long term uh, scouting behind it or anything like no. that you know, it's just a case of, oh, he's available, we'll get him because his dad played for Celtic and it'll, you know, it'll be great to have Larson in a jersey again. And I just, I, I, that, that's how I think it could have gone with it. As I say on Monday, JP, the Celtic marketing department would have loved it. Uh, that's, that's manna from heaven for for advertising, marketing and, and merchandise. That would have been, but when you look at our squad and you look at the players that we've got in that position, where is he going to play? You, where is he going to play? Hi. And and that's just maybe me being a bit green green round about the edges, not knowing how good he is. I'm sure yeah. he is. A, I'm sure he is a great player. You don't. I mean, he's he's playing in Russia and stuff like that, and there is club clubs after him. But I always just thought it was paper and agent talk. His yeah. agent was using Celtic's name basically yeah. for I mean, to try 25. to drum up interest. Eh? He's 25 as well. He obviously will want to play regular first team football. He'll be on hefty wages given what his uh, signing uh, figure was when he signed for for Spartak Moscow so like I, I think I think the idea of him coming and just being like yeah he's like Jack and is just going like I here have my number seven because your dad wore it and him suddenly being like a first team player I mean that the idea of that happening is fanciful at best so um, it was the same with this that French guy we were linked with yesterday. I mean, I did get excited as I did everybody. I think because as soon as Fabrizio Romano tweets anything, I well, think gospel. Well, he said that about Juranovic, and then that's ah, uh, yeah, that's Fabrizio Romano. Romano is turning out to be a bit of a false god, a false prophet with well, some of the things with some of the things that he's getting wrong. Um, we were, in advanced, we were in advanced talks with Misha yesterday, and then Postacoglu comes out and goes, nah, good player, but nah. Right, I'll, I'll read out what Postacoglu actually says. That's a great segue, mate. And you didn't make any, I never sent you the script. Mm. So you didn't make any what I was going to talk about. Nor did Celtic. <laughs> nah, no, no, that way. No, Know that we stick to a script anyway, especially on a, especially on a Thursday. We didn't <laughs> seem to stick to, stick, stick to a script. Anyway, Postacoglu says about Eddie Minshew and Aaron Moy last night when he was asked about it in the press. He says, we're still working away in the background. We know what we need. We are working with some targets we have. We are in no rush to get it done. There is nothing in terms of the players we have been linked to at the moment that's going to happen in the near future or in, or at all in some cases. 
I have an interest in every good footballer in the world, but there is a limited market which we can tap into. In terms of us, we've got a plan that we're sticking to, and so so I am pretty happy with the progress we are making on all fronts, and hopefully there will be some news coming out in the next couple of weeks before the season starts. So we've been linked heavily with three players over the last week. The guy for PSG, Aaron Moy, and F Fasto Vieira from Vera, sorry, from some place in Argentina, I can't remember. Argentinos, juniors. Juniors. So they're the three players that have been linked with. I think Poster Coglu was talking about the guy for PSG and Arn Moy. I don't think he was really talking about the guy for Argentinos Juniors. Uh, but for me, the guy for Argentino, Argentinos Juniors kind of suits because we were heavily linked with Van, Van, Vanessa Sosa, who, who's, who's ended up at Espanyol. I think we could go back into the South American market for a defensive midfielder because the type uh, the, 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 the type of player that we need for that position suits the identity of Souza. And South American teams produce these guys all the time for them to actually punt on. When was the last time you saw a decent Brazilian side, international side? 1982 was the last Brazilian team that was built with flair. I mean, you could argue the France '98 team. That was that was a decent Brazilian team, wasn't it? Aye, but the the, the Braz, Bra, Brazil produced footballers to sell to Europe. Mm. They, 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 they didn't actually produce footballers now in the Brazilian way, if, if you understand. They've actually they actually developed guys so they can actually sell to Europe, and they mm. develop all these defensive midfielders who are utterly fantastic at doing a defensive midfield job. And so Argentina, the Argentinians, the Uruguayans, have always got these wee quite tenacious defensive midfielders, tenacious athletic defensive midfielders. And that's, that's, the, kind of guys, that's the kind of guys that they're looking for. So I think, there's, I think there could be legs in the, Argen, the Argentinian guy. Well, especially that we've already dipped into that market. As long as, as, long as the Brazil manager isn't he taking the brown bag bungs to give players caps again, because that's what that's the the trap we fell into with Rafael Shite. If you remember, he'd been given like thirteen caps for Brazil, which was one of the sort of selling points and why he was probably had a five million pound price tag put on him, and then we went and paid the five million and. That guy was not an international centre half. No way in the world. I mean, not before Celtic, not during Celtic, and not after Celtic. Um, I mean, we were absolutely stung on that. But with regards to um, <clears throat> Vera, I mean, I don't know anything about the guy at all. Didn't know anything about Bernabe. Um, but you know, I'm completely happy to trust the manager's judgment if he thinks he can um, bring someone in from, you know, a climate where we've not really gone to before. I mean, it's insane to think that Bernabe is the first Argentinian player to sign for Celtic. Like that, that it's like 2022 and we've never had an Argentinian player and we've never explored that market. It seems bizarre, but... Um, I, if I like think a, lo a lot of that is down to permits, the work permits, and obviously maybe one of the good things to come out of Brexit and taking us out of the European Union as we can get these players in easier, so it's opened up that market. There has been quite a few other Celtic podcasts, I remember listening and say it's a market that we should be looking at, and seemingly it was Mark Wall's speciality to go to that market for the Man City group. So mm. we've already, as you say, we've already brought in Burnaby. It could be another market that we're actually looking for, and it could actually be that the centre half that we require and the defensive midfielder comes from that market. But they will be of a certain age. I do not expect us to actually sign an experienced centre half and an no. experienced central defensive midfielder. There will be guys that will be 20, 21, 22 ready for that move to a bigger club uh, as a stepping stone. Because right. as Poster Coglu says, there's a limited market that we can step into. Aye, which is why that Aaron Moy uh, link would surely be, you know, not a non-starter because he's thirty-two, is he not? Thirty-one, thirty-two. We're not going to sign a, we're not going to sign a guy to play in in our team uh, to, that's thirty-two years old. I just can't see that. Uh, not, it doesn't really fit in with them. We've already, we've already got an expensive 
defensive midfielder in his 30s in the squad that we didn't know that what we were going to do with. So I couldn't see us signing another one. No, that probably had nothing to do with Postacoglu as well. That was definitely a, a, a signing that was in the in, in the pipeline before him. I mean, I, I, I don't think that's... I still think there's maybe a chance that McCarthy could contribute this season. I, I don't. I, I said that before on here that I didn't think that it was uh, it was all over for him at Celtic, and I, I kind of hope it isn't because um, you, you want to see people like that contribute, you know, especially when they're on serious money, and also because he's a Celtic fan and he'll want to contribute. You know, it's not as if he's got no affiliation with the club, and you know, if I was a Celtic fan and I was him. It would be very frustrating for me to be, you know, um, albeit great getting the money, but, you know, you'd be bursting to play. You'd be wanting to play as many minutes as you possibly could, you know. You know, imagine <laughs> that feeling of scoring against, I don't know, Rangers or whatever. You know, that would be... <laughs> that, that, that would, that would, I, would, I, would, I would forgo a wage packet that week if you told me I was going to score against Rangers. Do you know what I mean? I'll, I'll, I would get arrested. <laughs> <laughs> Aye, no, uh, but just lastly on the French boy, with, see when, I, when we got linked with him yesterday and I was reading everything about him having dispute with PSG about how many minutes he was getting and not being in the first team squad and I'm like, how is that guy at 19 going to come in and get first team football at Celtic? There's no, like, where is he going to play in the midfield? Like, fair enough, come in and be like a a player that maybe plays sort of 20, 25 games and sort of beds into the in, into the squad. But there's no way, regardless of how good he is, there's no way he's going to come in and displace the midfield players that are already there. I, I, I can't see it. I, I, as much as I was excited at the time yesterday, I was like, well, this is game on. We're going to sign this PSG wonder kid. But then when you actually pick it apart, you're like, well, well where's he going to play? The it's, fee. The was fee was one... two and a half million. Uh... Yes, we yeah. signed we signed French Eddie for oh, nine right. million pounds, yeah. <laughs> and he was nowhere near the, the PSG first team. Uh, th this lad, uh, before he signed professionally, PSG was linked with Man City, Liverpool, and a number of other clubs all over Europe. Mm. If he's still that highly rated, they'll still look to be bringing him into like their squads. And if he is that highly rated, two and a half million, he's not gone for two and a half million euros. Nah. Man City recently sell, sold a midfielder to Southampton for £10 million mm -hmm. and he's been nowhere near the Man City first team. Mm. So, aye, there, there was a few, when, when, when you had a look at it, you're going, there's a, a few things no adding up here, the, like the, the price wasn't added, the, the price wasn't adding up. As you say, the number of appearances of the guy wasn't adding up. I even thought his strengths didn't add up to what we actually needed as well. I'm going. Mm. Is, I, I love Verratti. Verratti is one of my favourite ever players to play PSG. Great, great Italian international. But I'm going. We don't need that. We we do need a different type of player in that midfield. We've got a lot of great technical footballers in that middle of that park. Mm -hmm. What we're having to go is somebody that's big, athletic. It can actually break up counter attacks and and like be a hod carrier and move the ball on. I think that's the type of player we're looking for in the middle of the park, JP. We're not yeah. looking for another technically gifted great wee player. Oh, I mean, you've got Turnbull, you've got O'Reilly, you've got Hatati. You know, I, yeah. As as much as it was a, a fanciful thought, and you did think that there was some, you know, genuine weight to what was being said yesterday. It was just like when when it was shot down. I can't say I was surprised to be honest, um, because it did it did start to make you think. Well, that guy's not going to play week in, week out at Celtic, just the same way as Jordan Larson wouldn't play week in, week out at Celtic, because we've actually, we've actually, you see it, you saw it last night, we've actually got a good team, despite what anybody else might say from other quarters, you know, we, ha we have got a good side, they won the league under adversity, and oh, by the way, I watched that programme last night, uh, how Celtic won the league, did you watch that? Is that the one the BBC done a few, yeah. it was terrible, eh? Oh my God, I remember reading and hearing people talk about it at the time and being like, you know, you would it was like really doom and gloom, and it was really doom and gloom. It was like Kenny Miller sitting in like a dark warehouse on a chair, just like like gutted or on a bigging up 
James Tavernier at one point and talking about how great Rangers were and everything else. And then, like, it all the narrative only really changed for like the last five minutes of the program where you actually felt a bit of positivity and a bit of sunshine. And you're like, wait a minute, this was a brilliant season. And it, it, for about three quarters of that program, you'd think that there was going to be some sort of disaster for Celtic at the end of it. You know, it was like it should have been called, it should have been actually called How the League Was Lost. Yeah. Now, that that was a whole tone. Even the music that they used and the fact yeah. that it looked like they had kidnapped Kenny Muller and put him in a, in a warehouse <laughs> and they were holding up to gunpoint to actually, you have to say nice things about Celtic. Right? Aye. And, and, that, and that, Craig, that, Gordon, that, Craig Gordon as well. He was, I mean, it was all kind of, it was, it was, I mean, Craig Gordon wasn't he putting the boot in or anything like that, but it was like, focus, focusing on all this positivity about Hearts and all that because they beat us in the first day of the season and everything. It's like, they won one game against us. Big deal. We absolutely trounced them every other time we played them, beat them in their own back garden. The next time we played, when we actually had an organised side and players knew each other's names and stuff like that, you know what I mean? Like they, they got us, caught us cold. Fair play, they beat us in the last minute of a game. But all, all of that was like really like sort of emphasised in that in that programme. And even like the voiceover guy was really kind of on it. It was just like, and Celtic then went and won another game, and you're like, "Aye, we did. We won lots of games." <laughs> and like, and I don't think that the three 0 game at Celtic Park got this got the the, the proper uh, kudos that it should have got as well. You know that that should have been proper highlighted as being like the moment that, and obviously the Ibrox game. But the three 0 game was the turning point because we I went to the league. I can't believe like an organisation which is barred from Ibrox panders to them so much, talks them up so much. Like, uh, Kenny McIntyre's taking over the Saturday afternoon. Oh, he's not. Please he is. Uh, he's, uh, he's, Gordon. He's, he's, he's replacing Richard Gordon. And you're going, well, that's me no listening to that. Ah, a, guy, a, a guy who tried to wind up Posta Coglu all last season and Posta ah. Coglu eventually called him out about it. He says, well, you're not too happy. Aye. Aye, it's it's, a dread, it's dreadful. That Man, that's brutal. I, I I had a horrible feeling that he would end up getting that gig, and it, it's not really a surprise, but it, it's still a bit gutting to find that out. Because Richard Gordon, you know, obviously an Aberdeen fan, you know, uh, didn't ever really hide his colours, which you know I think that's fine. You know, it, it, it's it's. I think it's a bit different if you're a Celtic or Rangers. I, I wouldn't want, for example, I wouldn't want a Celtic fan as the anchor of BBC. Or do if you told me it was going to be, I mean, it wouldn't be. But if you told me it was going to be Pat Bonner that was going to be the new uh, <laughs> Richard Gordon, I mean, it definitely wouldn't be. No offense, Pat Bonner, but <laughs> um, I, I wouldn't want that because it's you, you don't want somebody that's partisan in in either direction. The Aberdeen fan is fine. It's it's kind of it's. In the, in the middle ground, although they do obviously hate Rangers as well, um, as they regularly sing about. But I just think oh, Kenny McIntyre being that guy is just like, nah, not, not having that. It is Kenny McIntyre, and I'm sure that the, the BBC have just lost. I mean, even them moving the programme for six o'clock, eh? Used to, if, if you're travelling home from work, you used to listen to like their, their nightly programme, eh? But I just find a pandering to... Eh, a, a, a club, an organisation which have barred them for nothing is yeah. just it just really, really... It's quite uh, weird that that's still going on, eh? Like, what a weird scenario where you've got, like, the BBC aren't allowed inside Ibrox. They can't... They don't get quotes from the manager. They don't get to speak to the manager. It's always a case of reading out what the manager said after the game and all that. Like, the only club in Scotland that do that. Like, how has that not been resolved? How have... How have they not sat down and thrashed that out and sorted it out? It, that's just bizarre to me. But no. I guess a lot of things are bizarre about Elf and Priest, <laughs> British Bears Corporation. That, that's what it looks like anyway. Definitely, that's what it sounds like. Peter M G, Michael McDonald. I kind of get hold of an away strip minus the sponsor. Celtic Store told me that they have no plans currently to get any more in. JP, you've got one behind you. I have, I, well, I got that in the, now that's exactly why I went out and got that, well, I didn't go out and get it, I ordered, I pre-ordered it before it went on sale without the sponsor, because I always, I always get the tops without the sponsor, 
So, and the reason why I do it early is because for exactly that reason, because there's a good chance that they can, they will, they will sell out. But I would have thought by rights, they still have to be able to stock that because it's, you know, the whole reason that they do the no sponsor thing is because it's a betting company. You know, if we were sponsored by, I don't know, uh, if we were sponsored by CR Smith, still say, they wouldn't, they wouldn't have to do a sponsorless jersey because CR mm-hmm. Smith isn't that contentious sponsor in terms of it's not alcohol, it's not betting, it's not cigarettes. So or any of those three vices, if that's your sponsor in your jersey, then I'm pretty sure you have to have an alternative without it. So it's an interesting one that they've said that they don't plan to get any any more. I, I want I want to get the home top without the sponsor. That looked look good, eh? That looked look good. Derided. I think it's oh. a smart top. I like it. I, don't, I, I didn't get the like people were going. I mean, I, it did look a bit naff when you saw the pictures of it with this with the silver. But you know, I I, I think it's a I think it's a, I like the color. I like the color of green. I like the pattern in the green. Um, I'll I'll, I'll be getting it. I, I I think when I've seen it over the last couple of games. I went, ah, it looks really good if the sponsor. It's got and mm. it, it just reminds me of Jackie Jackanowski in the 89 90 season. I, I think O'Reilly looks utterly stunning in it. And, he's, and he's been utterly brilliant in it. It just yeah. looks good. Even the socks look good. I wasn't too sure. And and there's green piping round about the, the shorts as well. I think it, I think it's a, it looks a decent kit. Really you noticed know, last night as well, they didn't have the names in the back. They just had the number. Aye. So that was like proper. That oh, retro feel, eh? Yeah. Okay, I, 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 I mean, obviously, it was just because it was a friendly. They'll have their names in the back for for league games and every other com- competitive game. But, like, it, it just, I look cool. I'm, I'm into it. And, and I'm quite excited about this third kit as well, which has been teased and online. There's, like, a like a silver and fluorescent kit coming out. Have you seen any pictures of that? I have not, no. I have not. They've, just, they've just, just been, like, a very close-up picture of, like, half of the badge and then the shoulder of the kit. It might be rubbish. I don't know if it's real or not, but I mean, every I didn't get how these strips have been leaked. <laughs> like that strip was on a hanger in a shop in Miami or something like that for sale before Celtic had even announced it. Like uh, that, That's a mistake. Eh? How that's, does that happen? You can't, that that's... can't happen. It would probably be that the, the, the store probably would have got it delivered and Aye. some wee... Some wee punter on the living wage just went and put, hung it up. No, yeah. no thought about it. It just, um, I, I, I like um, that the one that you've got there that way. It still has the groove on me. I'm still nah. a bit annoyed with the, the with the panel at the back. I think the green's a bit bright. Eh? It's not this. It's, it's. I think it looks a more a lime green. Nah, I think. Let yeah, me just that. Let me just a light in your house, mate. I'll be the camera. Be, be uh, the in the studio, those those tops look a mad color of yellow or green, and then you see them in you see them in real life, and they're you know like the the Celtic State of Mind stuff that Paul's got behind them. Aye. You know that, that they look completely different when you see them in in the in, in the flesh. So, no, nah, I'm I'm uh, I'm happy with the the kits as a kit aficionado. I, I'm happy with it. Well, I'm happy with the home one. The home one looks fine. But I, when it comes on JP, eventually I get kit blindness. I just see green and white. The <laughs> and they, and they just look the same to me. And some, if somebody would, would says to me last week, what kit did you have last season? I'd be like, eh, I would have to actually think about it. I would have to actually go back and actually think about it. Go, what kit did we? What kit did we actually have on last season? I just get kit blindness eventually, and it just ends up green and white hoops that I'm watching. Especially, especially when I go to the games, eh? I do mm. not. The details didn't really actually matter to me. It's just green and white. Speaking um, of going to the games, are you going on Saturday? I'm not actually. I'm not actually going because it's. It was my wife's fortieth birthday on Wednesday. Uh, no, no, Tuesday. It was my wife's fortieth mm. birthday on Tuesday, yeah, right. and 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 where I. We're having a garden party on Saturday, nice. so I'm not. I'm not actually going to the game. Um, and then the following week, when we play Norwich, I am going to State of Mind's launch in Edinburgh. I'm performing at State of Mind's launch at Edinburgh. Then the first home game of the season, I'm probably the only person that was happy that it was a half four kickoff because I'm performing at Bellardrum on the Saturday night, Amazing. and I've got to get back down from Inverness. 
for the game for the game on the Sunday. So if you're relying on trains, uh, I'd definitely leave a lot earlier than planned because uh, it's a it's a bit of a nightmare. Trains at the moment going anywhere like there's, there's always it. the danger you'll get delayed or cancelled or whatever. So, I well, yeah, you you should be glad that it's at half four and not half twelve on the Sunday because you'd be you'd be struggling to make that. I think if you were in Inverness on the Saturday night. I am. I'm staying in Inverness on the Saturday night as well, eh? yeah. so I'll be, we'll be coming down on the Sunday. So, yes. Uh, so, I, I'm, I'm. I'm buzzing for Saturday. I'm buzzing to get back to Celtic Park and, yeah, looking forward to just uh, seeing folk that sit around about me and all that and catching up because I missed the. Did I miss the last game of this? No, no. I was at the last. I was at that the last game of the season. The who was it against Motherwell? Um, yeah, we, we yes, beat Motherwell. Motherwell I think, I, yeah. Uh, but it just seems like a there's a couple of months, and you're used to seeing these people every every couple of weeks and having patter, and it's good to see the folk again when you when you get the chance, you know. I definitely, I'm, I'm hoping to, I'm hoping to actually make the opening game of the season. I really are hoping to make that, but I can't make the two friendlies, which is quite, which is disappointing. It is disappointing. Paddy Laverty, heart is going to cost us playing so far up the pitch. One of the one of the things in the three games, JP, is Joe Hart has now become an auxiliary sleeper and sits mm-hmm. about thirty yards from his goal. Um, I'm not going to blame Hart for that because it's Brian Wilson. Hopefully, that's the Beach Boy Brian Wilson, but it's spelt differently. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's down to the manager, not Hart. It's quite obvious that the managers told the goalkeepers that they now must come out and actually take possession of the ball, and mm-hmm. I'm preparing myself for us for us to lose a goal. With, with the keeper so far out, but it's the manager's instructions. I'm not going to blame the goalies for it. Nah, I mean, it, there's no way he's doing that without without instruction. You know, he's not going to be, you know, going against uh, going against the the manager's uh, orders to do something as mental as that. You know, it's uh, you know, you, you're either doing that or you're not. And if if he was told not to do it, then we'd soon we'd soon see. So it'd be interesting to see what happens. Playing at home, you know, will he do that at home at Celtic Park, or was it just in those games? I have, I have no idea. I hope not, anyway, because it is a bit. There was it's happened a couple of times, isn't it, where we've nearly lost a goal from distance in these friendlies. Certainly looked like we nearly lost one last night, like early on as well. Um, you're reading comments, aren't you? <laughs> I am. I'm, I'm reading the comments. I'm trying to bring up some of the decent ones, man. Eh? <laughs> Sorry if I look like a zone, zone do. I was I do I do listen to you, mate. I don't listen to you. Don't worry. <laughs> Aye. Uh, no, I, I I certainly don't think that um it's not it's not it's not something that Joe Hart's decided to do, put it that way, because I don't think I don't think <laughs> you, you, you hear and see how the manager is in training and at games as well. He'll let a player know if he's doing something that he doesn't want him to do. Aye. <laughs> you know, what was that game where was it who did he have a go at? He absolutely Bald at some of the Celtic. Liam park. Scales, and he's never been seen since. <laughs> well, he's he's in Aberdeen. That, that says that says a lot. It says a lot that he's he's no longer at the at the club. But I hope he does well at Aberdeen. He's, he's starting games for them, isn't he? He's playing. He is, aye. So I he, he needs game time. I think there'll be you'll see quite a few gone out and loan towards the end of the window. I think Big Boss and Ball will go on loan. Rocco Vata, I think, will, will go on loan as well. Um, and there might be, a, 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 for the guys that are featured in the, in the games, I think they'll be the two young lads. I think Boston Law was already outgrew the B team. He's mm-hmm. there, probably already outgrew the, the, the low in the league. And the same mm-hmm. with Rocco Vata. I would like to see them getting game time at a higher level. Mm-hmm. Uh, whether that's in the the SPA, the Premiership or the Championship. Eh? But mm-hmm. it'll be good. it'll be good for... Uh, Adam Montgomery and Liam Scales to go out and get game time in the Premiership, and for Celtic to make a make a decision on them when they actually come back. Um, oh, where's the comment that I was going to bring up? Elfin Priest. When you see how Taylor and Ralston improved in the last year, I think there's cause for hope for Stephen Welsh. I think there is cause for hope, but I, I wonder. And I mentioned this to Colin last night, JP. I wonder if we've actually written off Tony Ralston too early. I mean, we thought he maybe peaked last season, but do you think he's got another level to go up? Uh, quite possibly. I mean, it, when, 
once you get to a, a level uh, when you're comfortable amongst your, I mean, I think Tony Tony Ralston probably had the bit between his teeth last season and felt like it was there was maybe a bit of an imposter syndrome where he's like, I'm out of my depth here, but I want to prove myself that I can mix it with these guys. But then he's got to the point now where he knows he can, you know, and he knows he's he knows he's on a level with um, players that are have you know been signed for a lot more money or you know maybe on better wages than he is. So having a season all experience surely helps, you know. And he's had he's had a full season playing in the first team fairly regularly. I mean, I don't know how many appearances he made he made last season, but it was certainly. Mm-hmm. Well, way more than he's made in his entire five, six years at Celtic. And it's quite mad to think that he's only 22, 23. But yeah, he's been in the Celtic first team or the Celtic first team squad for... Obviously, there's been loan moves in, in amongst that. But, you know, he's been part of the, the first team squad for for five years. Aye. <laughs> you know, like, that, that, that's you know that that's that's invaluable and then you think of guys like mcgregor and how mcgregor kicked on you know um after a, a loan move and then after you know sort of getting in and around the first team and getting his confidence up and knowing that he can mix it so yeah i mean it still blows my mind that two years ago we were sitting here at, in the summer or even no a year ago we were sitting in the summer going Tony Ralston's not good enough to play for Celtic, would be quite happy if he left. Then he gets a year deal, mm-hmm. and we're all like, wow. Let's, let's, is- let's not beat about the bush, JP. He only got that year deal because he was only right back at the club. Aye, aye. They didn't aye. have to run him. That was the only reason they got that year deal. And he earned his extension. But now you're having a look at him. I had a look at him for Scotland in the 45 minutes yesterday. I'm going, maybe I've underestimated where he can actually go. Mm-hmm. Maybe the drop off between him and Juranovic is not going to be as great, and mm-hmm. Tony Ralston's going to actually boost on quite a bit. Well, the thing as well is that he's trusted. He's tr- he's clearly trusted by the manager. You know, like the manager wouldn't be playing him in games. You know, I I've not heard or seen anything to say that Tony Ralston is is just there to fill a jersey. You know, he's there because he's clearly. You know, a likable person in the in the dressing room. You know, I watched that uh, interview that they did on Celtic TV with him and Greg Taylor. You know, he seems to be pretty good banter. You know, he's, he can take the mick out of himself. Um, mm-hmm. Isn't too big for his boots, and that's exactly what you want in a player. You know, you want someone that's not that doesn't have you know this sort of oh I'm I'm this or I'm that. You know, he's just happy to be there, happy to be able to play for Celtic and uh it, it, hi it's 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 really really good to see a Scottish player do that and prove so many people wrong including me you know I I certainly didn't think Anthony Ralston a year ago had a, any sort of future at Celtic wouldn't have thought it for a no, second no and, no you, and you didn't there's nothing wrong with like obviously admitting that because I, I don't see there's not many people maybe Amy was probably one of the few and I know Paul like bigged him up after that Livingston game when he came in in that game when we had to play loads of players because of COVID um, in the January I think it was and Ralston did stick out that game mm-hmm. but you just think to yourself oh well big deal he's played in a half decent game against Livingston at Celtic Park that's not really a reason to be hanging your hat on him for the right back role um, but when he when he's done it consistently and he's contributed with assists and goals and you know putting his putting his body about on putting his body on the line with tackles and things like that and it's, it's a total accumulative thing where you, you're like right i can make a decision based on what i've seen and what i've seen is he's more than just a builder do you know what i mean he's more than a brick yeah, he's more he's, he's, he's more than he's more than a brick uh, bac hopefully tony ralston won't turn into rocky balboa and Brilliant. rocky free complacent <laughs> keep your eye on the tiger tony that, that, that's a, that's a great 80s reference for all the celtic daz here danielle f comes in and says no he was screaming welsh uh, oh, I, yeah, thought, I, I, I right. thought it was liam scales that was that was coming in was Sean, well. Sean McAteer, anyone name a person who talks in their crap than Kev? 
answers on a postcard, please, because because <laughs> I'm sure my wife wants to wants to know if anybody talks more crap than what I do. Uh, Alex, but aye, Alex Burrell, listen to the Kev is like listening to Keith Chegwin. Keith Chegwin has they been cancelled or anything like that, has he? Eh? No, Chegers no, no. plays pop and that he's still he's no. still all right. Well, um, no, I mean, unfortunately, he's not with us anymore. But uh, yeah, I met Keith Chegwin in. Uh, outside the BBC studios in London about, I don't know, maybe about seven or eight years ago. I just went up to him and uh, like we guide him basically in the street and got a picture of him. <laughs> well, I mean, he's been like a guy I'd known since I was a, since I was a kid, you know, so uh, it was uh, it was quite cool to meet him. But uh, you, you don't in any way remind me either visually or audibly of oh, Keith <laughs> Chegg when I, I don't know no. Chegg's plays pop I remember you watching that when I was a lad um AJSC technology Kev is right we need a midfield plumber rather than an artist I think we do I think we've got enough technicians in there uh, Alex Burrell comes in and asks me again what I'm doing at Belgium what are you doing stand up uh Alex, you've heard my patter on this. I'm not a stand-up comedian, that's for sure. Uh, I'm doing a spoken word set about music in the 1990s. That's what I'm doing at Bella Drum. Uh, and I think we'll answer the Everton question before we go, uh, JP. Let's have a wee look. Studs Lanigan, no, Kevin, it was a St. St. Domingo that I mentioned earlier, Church of England, I believe. It's to do with the Irish heritage of the Scotty Road area around Goodison. And Paul Mooney comes in to confirm Everton have a strong Catholic heritage. They always had a solid support in Dublin and Ireland, generally up to Liverpool, assuming a super successful club status in the 1970s. So, th so there we go. Everton are a good addition to the, the to the Super Cup. It sounds like um, in well, Australia, Alan Stubbs, Alan Stubbs, uh, Alan Stubbs as well. John Collins, John David Collins, Moyes. Moyes, eh? there, There's a few players in that. Neville Did Slough, Collins, the Collins huh? go in, did Collins, Collins go to Everton after Monaco? Was that yes, I Collins so. went to Everton. I so. Aye, there's a few good Celtic connections there. Hopefully the, the, the lads in Australia will have a good time, but we're playing Blackburn on Friday, on Saturday it is, half past 12 kickoff. I hope we absolutely stuff them. I've never liked Blackburn since Graham Soonis actually went there and they bought the championship eh, mm -hmm. in, in the early 90s, Jack Walker. But JP, it's been a pleasure actually talking to you on a Thursday. We went for an hour and seven minutes. I never realised uh, my work will be phoning me wondering where I actually are. Everybody like and subscribe and I'll speak to you all next week. Hail, hail, okay. thanks very much. Cheers.